let's hear about Fluent Pit. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I am Patrick. I'm here in person, and my co-presenter can't travel today, so uh, he's joining us, Eurovision style from the UK. Um, so Phil, just say hi, just hi, to make everybody. sure. Yep, there we go. Yeah, um, hi everybody. Can't be there. Cool, we're all good. Right, let's dive in. So it's on you, Phil. Okay, so behind what uh, we're seeing today is uh, really a, a message about uh, chat ups. So let, let's talk about what chat ups is and what chat ups to us. The background really is that a few years ago, chat ups became a topic for a little while and it seems to have been quite. Now, it hasn't got quiet because it's stopped, but it's very much uh, a case of... Phil, we might have to uh, just drop to me, I think. Well, the opposite um, very standard, very common. I'll just kill it. <laughs> right, so obviously the connection wasn't quite good enough for that. So today we're going to cover chat ops and specifically look at using Fluent Bit to kind of power, power it as the back end and do all the hard work. So what is ChatOps? So from a ChatOps kind of definition, it was, I think, collaboration with instant messaging for DevOps is kind of the sort of Wikipedia kind of uh, definition of it. So the idea here is that you can alert in certain channels and then respond in the same channels. Try and speed up that kind of response, make it easier, more mobile, um, more friendly for, for people to use, much more easier to do on the move and maybe a bit more inclusive for people who can't be sat at the desk all the time or, or have access to everything. So what do we need for chat ops? So we need some kind of way of um, notifying of something and then picking up the response. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff I'm gonna show today. Uh, so let me just get to the slides. There's a, there's a lot of things we can cover in chat ops as well. Um, how you can use uh, AI in the future, lots of different things as well. T for today, I'm just gonna cover a very short little demo and um, how to use Fluent Bit to do it. So, in case anyone isn't aware of what Fluent Bit is, let me just kind of go through it and make sure my timer is definitely working. There we go. So, I'm a Fluent Bit maintainer, um, so I have been for a few years now. Um, so I kind of wanted to cover what Fluent Bit is, for those people who don't know, um, and, and why we're using it. So Fluent Bit, you know, right at the simplest terms, is a way is a telemetry agent that, that works on telemetry pipelines. So we started out doing logs in a very much an embedded context, and because of that kind of low resource mindset and, and capabilities for Fluent Bit, we've been adopted by most of the cloud providers in the world. So. GCP, AWS, Azure, Oracle, um, uh, plenty of others all use Fluent Bits under the hood. Uh, there's a lot of, you'll find a lot of agents as well for observability vendors, New Relic, um, a few of the others as well are all basically rebadged Fluent Bit under the hood. And we started out doing logs, but yeah, since, you know, for the last few years, we've been able to do traces and metrics as well. And the, the core of a telemetry pipeline is essentially we can handle a large number of inputs, we can do some processing on it, and then we can send to a large number of outputs. So with Vendor Neutral, it's the CNCF graduated project, all those kind of good stuff. Um, today, I'm gonna focus on using the Lua filter um, as a way of doing chat ops. So the Lua filter runs Lua code, um, which if you do any Roblox programming or stuff like that, you, you will have seen. It's also used in switches, loads of other places as well. Quite a few tools actually use Lua as a way of providing a nice kind of interpreted language uh, front end into doing some, some very powerful processing. For Fluent Bit, we're all C, so we compile the Lua down with the Lua JIT into uh, the actual runtime stuff. Um, and Fluent Bit also does uh, WASM, Golang output plugins and stuff like that, which is what we did um, for our commercial solutions. Yeah, where are we? There we are. So, how are we going to use Fluent Bit? Uh, so, for the demo today, I'm going to use um, the uh, Slack output plugin and a dummy input. So, we're going to kind of simulate an alert with the dummy input. 
The idea here is that we'd be thinking, uh, say you've got Fluent Bit already deployed, forwarding your logs, your metrics, whatever. You can do a load of processing there to alert uh, on any kind of output. The, there's various HTTP outputs, TCP outputs, OTEL outputs, and then vendor-specific outputs as well. Um, but for the purposes of a chat ops demo, we're just going to be looking at how can we use Slack to alert and, th and then act on those kind of alerts as well. Um, to work with Slack, we've uh, actually Phil put together the, a kind of Java, a basic Java web server that talks to Slack, gets any kind of response as a Slack app, uh, and then sends that response to FluentBit. So that's, that's what that little Java bit at the bottom is. Um, we also send via an HTTP output in the demo to that web server to tell them, oh, we've just alerted, here's the alert in Slack, make sure you watch it. Uh, and, that, and that's what it's gonna cover. Come on, let's go to the next one. This is not going too well. There we go. <laughs> right, and how are we going to respond? So we, the idea with chat ops is we can have a little bit of a discussion. Uh, we get an alert. I, in our demo, it's all going to be just in the channel. But if you're doing it in real life, like we, we do in Chronosphere and a few other places, you probably want to chat in a, in a thread. You probably want to do things like uh, direct your, your messages straight to the, to, the, to the app. So you do like slash and then the app name and, and what, it, what you want it to do. But in our case, we're going to do a quick like, oh, I've got an alert. In this case, for the demo, we just generate a dummy one about permissions. But potentially, it could be anything. Uh, you know, you could scale up things in Kubernetes or, or in cloud environments. You could purge some logs. You could do loads of different things. Um, and the idea here is that we, we're just showing you a nice, simple pipeline for how you do it. So that, that Slack message is going to get picked up by the um, Java web server and then fed to FluentBit. Uh, and FluentBit then invokes the Lua processor um, as a way of doing all the hard work. So the, the big thing here is, is that kind of Lua code and, and the FluentBit pipeline showing you how to, how to do it. So I just wanted to, to kind of uh, highlight some of that. Um, and that's pretty much everything there. So we have a little demo. Um, I think I'm probably a little bit early for the demo, but we'll, we'll jump straight into it. Uh, and then we can talk through some of the code as well, potentially. Um, so everything's in, in GitHub. Um, I think I committed it uh, late last week. Um, and we can kind of walk through some of the stuff, and then I'll, I'll show you how it all, all fits together. So this is the Lua code. Um, and this Lua code is intended to just, show, just run some, some defined scripts when it receives a command. Um, the idea here is that when you roll out Fluent Bit, you can roll it out with a set of scripts or reconciliation actions, everything like that, well managed in, in GitOps if you, if you want to do it that way. Um, I, I kind of wanted to show you the power of some of the Lua stuff. In this case, we're just taking some HTTP input, um, converting it to the name of a script to run and a specific node, run it, make sure we run it on that node, collect the output, send the output back. Um, but you could you could do anything there. You could you know you could change it to to do whatever it needs to do. You could build in some very bespoke kind of business logic. You could do lots of different things there, and that's what we see as well commercially as well. Customers can can write um, Lua code quite easily, or GoLang code, or templating stuff like that to do very complex business logic if they want to. Uh, we also have. I will just show you a couple of other bits and pieces. So here's the Compose stack. I'm just running a couple of containers, one for Fluent Bit, one for um, the web server. Uh, and it's all in the, all in the, um, the repo. And here's the, the operations config. So this is where we've got the input from HTTP. We've got, um, we're also capturing the output from the Lua scripts, which is getting forwarded to some local log files. Um, we're running the Lua filter. And then we're sending all the stuff to either Slack or HTTP, depending on what it needs to do. So I'll jump into the demo. Let's get it up. So here's, here's our Slack channel. Um, just ignore all that. We're just trying to wipe out all the stuff that, that we'd sent before. So that's the main reason that's in there. Uh, let me make sure that's up. Yep. Um, OK, and then this is our repo up here. I've not really done anything. Uh, I'm just going to run the, the stack up. 
And then what happens when Fluent Bit runs up is with our dummy alert, we just fire it straight away at startup, but we only fire one of them, um, just, just to make it a bit more straightforward to, to work with. So there you can kind of see, we've got um, our little alert come through on our Fluent Bit uh, app. So there's a little bit of stuff in the repo as well around setting up tokens and things like that. Um, but we, I've, I'm not really going to show that because it's pretty straightforward. And then we can have a little discussion here. Um, Phil can sort of talk about what he's going to do. And we can say, oh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, we need to fix this. So let's do that. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a delay on the, uh, the Slack update. Um, and in the background, you can kind of see, so it's a Java web server, it's a bit basic, it's just polling the Slack API. Really, this should all be event-driven you know, in, in the Slack app, but the, the goal here wasn't to show a perfect Slack web server. So Phil's um, sending the command here, he's highlighting what he wants it to do, send it to node one, which is just the compose stack I'm talking about, fix permissions, uh, which is a, a, a script that we've already sort of pushed out to the nodes. It's all defined in GitOps, and it, it's kind of well managed that way. Okay, and then in the, over here, where's my mouse cursor gone? You can kind of see um, the output from, from what it's done. So this is just sending it all over, receiving it, and then it's running, running it, and at the bottom, you can kind of see, uh, if you look at the demo in the, in the thing, we just echo the Tremod, but in real life, you could do a Tremod, you could do whatever, whatever you need. Um, so the goal there, very much a, um, just to show you kind of a, a, a very simple, simple way of doing um, a, a pipeline with Lua that can do various different things. Uh, it's a bit, Potentially can be a lot easier to work with chat ops if, if you're doing stuff in the same channel you're alerting on. We do it internally for stuff like um, deployments have failed um, with a couple of clusters or something like that. Do you want to continue? Do you want to fail them all over? Do you want to revert them? We do it with uh, elevated permissions as well. People can approve it in, in the Slack channel rather than having to jump into 20 other different logins and, and find everything. Um, so there's a kind of... In this demo, there's a set of prescripted actions. Maybe you could extend it to do other things. You could um, do all different stuff, really. I, I just kind of wanted to show you a, a very simple example of what we're doing here. So that's the demo. And then jumping in more into Lua stuff. Um, so Lua, for me, as the Fluent Bit maintainer, was the kind of the focus of the talk for me. Phil was very much on the demo and some of the chat up stuff, as you may notice from my much lighter weight uh, covering of it. Um, but I wanted to highlight uh, for Fluent Bit, we well, and Fluent D as well, we provide a, a little sandbox there so you can mess about with input, write your own Lua and see what the output is all in, all live, um, and very easy to debug stuff and, and test it out before you have to deploy it in production and, and do debugging in production or, or anything like that. Um, so Lua, certainly when I first started using Fluentbit, it was a big concern for me around performance. It's an interpreted language. How does that impact when you're running, you know, in, in quite heavyweight production stuff? Do you want to do it there? All those kind of questions as well. Um, we do use Lua JIT to compile it down, and to be honest, it's pretty good. Um, there are some other things as well. You know, it's there's the maintenance cost of you could have very simple filters all chained together doing each task, or you could combine it all into one uh, large Lua filter, and it, it might be easier to maintain um, a nice bit of Lua as opposed to writing some very brittle and hard to maintain regex or something like that. But that's personal preference, and it might depend on the team as well. Um, and also, there is a little bit of cost if you're chaining um, filters together, so each one you do has to pack and unpack the data. So if you just do that once for one large complex filter, it might be cheaper depending on your pipelines than doing lots of little uh, unpack and pack operations uh, for a longer pipeline. We do have some WASM support as well. Um, I don't really do WASM. WASM has been around for quite a while now, but I've never really tried it. Um, and there's also any language that can output 
uh, a shared library can write a custom plugin, so you can do Golang, you can do anything with LLV LLVM backends. Um, but commercially, yeah, we, we do quite a lot of Golang filters, plugins, all those kind of things as well for bespoke behavior. Um, and the mandatory sales slide, um, well, not, not quite there yet, but so Lua modules is a, is a way of, um, I don't know if anyone's used Lua before, there's a, there's a package manager called uh, Lua Rocks, which is a good way of adding system dependencies. So you might think, Lua, it's all interpreted. I can just write stuff, and it will do it. I don't need to provide anything else. Um, you can do that with some modules, as long as you keep them completely Lua native. Um, but quite often, there's a dependency on a system library, libc, those kind of things as well. So you might need to consider that when you're writing stuff. Uh, I mean, it's the same with Golang as well. You can't necessarily always compile it all down to a completely static binary, but, but there are ways of doing it with Lua um, to make sure you only use Lua native components. Um, but if you're deploying it and you want to take advantage of a system library that does, regex would be quite a good one. Um, a lot of Lua regex modules rely on some system dependencies um, because it's just a bit faster than, than doing it all interpreted. Um, so Lua rocks is a way of doing that, and i kind of shown there's some Lua code, there's how you load it, uh, that's how you run it as well. Uh, so if, if you want to use it in a container environment, just make sure you include any system dependencies you need as well. Oh, yeah, so here's the sales slide. <laughs> I'll try and be quick. Uh, so uh, we just got acquired, Calyptia, by Chronosphere, and um, part of what we were doing was using um, Fluent Bit pipelines uh, with various customers to um, collect data across different things. There's some custom uh, input plugins, custom output plugins. But the big bit in the middle um, was just some uh, Lua, we call them Lua processing modules. Um, but the idea there is we've got a whole library of pre-built things for redaction, removing sensitive information, uh, excluding stuff, adding stuff. Sometimes it's quite useful to add context. Um, and quite often you also want to deduplicate, you want to do stuff just to reduce your Splunk bills or, or wherever they're going to in the end. Uh, redaction was quite a good one as well. You know, it, from a security perspective, if the data never leaves the node, then it can't possibly be compromised as well. Um, so I just wanted to kind of show, show that that's what we're kind of doing. But this is just kind of a glorified version of the previous open source one that, that we already have as well, which I kind of showed you there as well. Um, oh, and there's some uh, jazzy, uh, here's, here's what it looks like in the UI with the sandbox. Um, I don't think this is very long, hopefully. Um, but this is, uh, these are all the different Lua modules you can do out of the box. Uh, I think I recorded this the other day. So we, we tend to be adding them all the time as well. So I'm a really big fan of Lua now. Uh, I never really used it before, but it, it seems really useful and great to, to work with. It makes it very easy to, to write some complex business logic. Uh, which is which is always good. So, uh, kind of the end of my presentation, a bit quick. Um, definitely on time, hopefully. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of um, talk a bit about what what we're doing. There's a few links there. So Phil, my co-presenter, has written quite a few books. He's um, a, an Oracle developer evangelist. So. If you want, he's written one on, on, on Kubernetes you can download for free. There's some training, there's the Slack there, uh, there's, there's some other bits and pieces. Um, but yeah, uh, so there's lots of things we could do to improve some of this stuff around security, maybe changing stuff, improving the server. But the goal here was just to show you a very simple pipeline that you can do input, Lua filter, do whatever you like, and then get an output. And there's, there's all the references, so. Any questions? Hello, and thank you for the talk. No worries. Um, I used to use the uh, logging operator to do logging stuff. The ban is that Banzai? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, it, it used to be, I yeah, think. Yeah, did they? I think they donated it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, are there any obvious reasons why I couldn't use uh, this method to like forward stuff to Slack uh, using the logging operator? Are you aware of anything? Or no, no. So well, there is a fluent operator as well. Uh, any, I mean, it's just config. It's, yeah, does that, that's one of the good reasons for Lua, using Lua. Is it, it is just config. It's not binaries or, or anything like that. So yeah, there shouldn't be any reason why. As long as 
Assuming the logging operator lets you define Lua stuff, but the Helm chart does, so I would expect the, um, the, the operator to do it as well. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit quick. <laughs> so um, my question will be about Lua and its limitations. Mm -hmm. So are there any limitations? And uh, uh, I will try to specify, can Lua code utilize more than a single thread, more than a single CPU? Uh, on FluentBit, yes, as long as you use the new YAML format for specifying it. So. In the YAML format now, you can attach filters to the specific input or output you want them to run on, and those inputs or outputs can be threaded and, and use their own thread threading for, for that. I would say, to answer your question about what can't you do, the big issue, I'd say, is system dependencies. If you introduce a dependency on the system that's not there, then you may see weird stuff at runtime if it just fails when it does a syscall or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but usually, you would that's quite a violent death, and you would probably spot it quite quite quickly as well. Um, I'd say it's probably a bit better than WASM, which has a lot of sandboxing around what it can and can't do. Um, so it might it might be better, uh, but you can blow your foot off if you if you try hard enough. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. because law sounds like a big gun, uh, and the problem is so it runs not, not that. Yeah, so so we use a legit. Um, a separate open source project, we vendor it in and, and build all that. So there is an option to run in protected mode, which is the default, which tends to try and pr prevent a lot of the problems that you would have. But maybe there might be a performance hit and you might want to run unprotected or, or whatever. For some, for some reason, you, you might want to really say, please, please blow my foot off. Um, and yeah, you, you might be, it, it might go wrong. I, I yeah. can't say it won't. Because there was uh, a problem with Lua in Ingress and Jinx uh, that you can use Lua script to steal the token by reading from the file system. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, probably it can, so the fluent bit can be vulnerable to it also. Yeah, I don't think necessarily that's a Lua <laughs> problem. You could get fluent bit to just print of out course. all its tokens or, or anything. Um, but there's probably ways of mitigating it and, and preventing those kind of problems, yeah. Okay, thank you. The delicate balance between a feature and a vulnerability. That it's always a feature. <laughs> it's just how you use it, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Cheers.